It's the top of the hour. I'd like to welcome everyone to GlomCon today. Um, Dio Agus back in Houston, Texas. Um, we're very excited today for our series and collaboration with the ERA EDTA. Um, and our talk today is latest insights into the epidemiology of COVID-19 and nephrology from the ERA CODA. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Kate Stevens, the consultant nephrologist at Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow and our partner in leading this series. Thanks, uh, Dia. Um, so yes, today's session is topical and um, hopefully it will generate a lot of discussion. So our presenter today is Prof Ron Gansevoort, who's from Groningen in the Netherlands. So Prof Gansevoort is a nephrologist and he coordinates the ERA CODA working group. On the panel, we have uh, four esteemed um, panellists. So Prof Luke Hilbrands, who is a nephrologist from Nijmegen, also in the Netherlands, and a member of the ERA CODA working group. And alongside Prof Hilbrands, we have Prof Kitty Yeager, also a member of ERA CODA working group, director of the ERA EDTA registry, and a professor of medical informatics and kidney epidemiology based in Amsterdam. Dr. Samira Bell, who's a nephrologist from Dundee in Scotland, and she is chair of the Scottish Renal Registry. And finally, we have Prof Alberto Ortiz, who is editor in chief of Clinical Kidney Journal, has been involved with the ERA EDTA registry on an ongoing basis and is a nephrologist from Madrid in Spain. Now, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat as always. If you'd like us to go to you live, then just indicate that and we can do that. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Prof Gansevoort for his presentation. Thanks, Ron. But thanks again for the uh, kind invitation and also to give us the opportunity to uh, give a presentation here on our results of ERA CODA. And I made 25 slides uh, for you explaining some of our findings. And in the first slide, I'm explaining what is ERA CODA. And ERA CODA is an acronym and it stands for the European Renal Association COVID-19 database. And this database was established in March 21 by the ERA EDTA Council. Uh, it is a RedCap database with prospective data collection, granular data of patients on dialysis or living with a kidney transplant that developed COVID-19. And there are several registries nowadays. Um, of patients on dialysis or living with a transplant, but this database has been specifically designed to collect data on COVID-19. So we have very specific disease and treatment characteristics in our database that none of these other databases have. The aim to establish this database was twofold. First, to investigate the clinical cause and outcomes of kidney replacement uh, therapy patients with COVID-19 and second, to gain information on risk factors for mortality, because we thought that such information may guide clinical treatment decisions, support triage strategies for admission to intensive care units, and lead perhaps even to interventions. And by February 24, we had data of more than 4,000 patients with COVID-19, granular individual level data, and 30% of these patients are kidney transplant recipients and 70% are dialysis patients. And these page, uh, data were filled in by 200 physicians working in 30 countries across Europe. And these were the first results obtained during the first wave on the left ICU admission rate, on the right mortality. And what you can see here, that mortality is high, 25% in dialysis patients and 21% in transplant uh, patients. We always report on day 28 mortality, and I think that's a valid endpoint because what you see mortality is most apparent in the first two, three weeks after a diagnosis then flattens out. So uh, day 28 mortality rates are a valid endpoint. Mortality higher in dialysis patients than in transplant patients, but when you look at ICU admission rates, it is the other way around transplantation patients are more often admitted than dialysis patients. And perhaps that might suggest under treatment of dialysis patients. And I'll come back to that in my uh, later during my presentation. Here I show you the data of the first wave and the second wave. So on the x-axis, we have calendar month. On the y-axis, the number of patients diagnosed. And what we notice in the first wave in ERA CODA, 
1,200 uh, patients in the second wave, 1,400 patients. And when you look at 28-day mortality, in the first wave, it was 24%. And in the second wave, it is 19%. When you look at ICU admission rates, 11% in the first wave and 7% in the second wave. And people might interpret this as perhaps treatment, better treatment has become available. But I doubt that because when there would be treatment, it is nearly always in the intensive care unit setting and not in the home setting or out of the ICU setting in a, uh, in a hospital. And when we look at hospitalization rates, we also see a difference second wave versus first wave. And in my interpretation, this means that we are nowadays seeing another type of patients. We are screening more and we are finding a lot of patients low in symptoms that have a corona infection, but these patients are not at risk. So that is also the reason why hospitalization rate went down. When you now look at in-hospital ICU admission rates, and let's assume that the reason to admit patients to a hospital has been similar over time, you see that there is no change in the second wave versus the first wave. And when you look at in-hospital mortality, there's also no change whatsoever. So I don't think there has been a, a better treatment of our patients. We are only looking at other patients. That also may perhaps explain the mortality rate that changes over time. Here again, calendar month on the x-axis, y-axis is now mortality rate as percentage, and that is a moving average. And at first it was high, very high, then it goes down to approximately 10%. And when the second wave is peaking, it increases again to around 20% uh, mortality rate. But we are looking at different patients because I here now listed patient characteristics in April 2020, August 2020, and November 2020. Different numbers of subjects, but when you look at the patient characteristics, when the infection rates were low, so the time point between the two waves, patients were seen that were much younger were less frail, had far less symptoms of COVID, like in low CRP, but also far less shortness of breath. And that explains that mortality rates change over time. It is dependent not on the type of treatment, but on the type of patients that we are seeing. And when we read epidemiological studies, we have to be aware from what time point these uh, studies report when we want to compare them. It is about comparison. I um, just already made a kind of comparison between dialysis and transplant patients, but I would also like to make a comparison with the general population. And in the general population, when you look at the age categories, you can see that the older subjects are, the higher the mortality rate. And we often see, think as nephrologists, that COVID-19 is especially a problem of the older dialysis patients. And indeed, when you look at dialysis patients, the older dialysis patients are, the, high, the, the, the larger the problem. But when you look at absolute risk increase, dialysis patients versus the general population, then it's 9.1% minus 0.3%, an 8.8% absolute risk increase. And you can do that for all these age categories. And what you see, is that it, it's in nearly all the age categories around 10% absolute risk increase. And when you look at relative risk increase, the relative risk in dialysis patients to die of COVID-19 compared to the general population is 1.4 fold higher, but in younger patients, it is 30 fold higher. So is COVID-19 mortality a problem of the older dialysis patients or perhaps even more important, a problem for younger dialysis patients? And I think this is a kind of paradigm shift that we should look more at the importance of corona infection also, especially in younger patients. That's one 
teaching point here. Uh, second teaching point is that we assume that prognosis is very bad, but when you look even in the oldest age group of dialysis patients, most of the patients survive. And I think that is an important conclusion. And when we look then at outcome, we often think that outcome is very poor, especially in older patients. But what we also did in Irakoda, looking at outcome after a COVID-19 episode, and we did so three months after the episode. And we asked their physicians where the functional outcome after three months was comparable to pre-COVID-19. And to my surprise, almost 90% of patients that was reported that, that functional outcome is similar. And only in a minority, it was lower, but then again, around 70% was thought to reach functional outcome conform pre-COVID-19 within one year. And when looking at mental outcome, the results were even slightly better. By far the majority have already a mental outcome that was similar as pre-COVID-19. So most all the hemodialysis patients survive and their outcome is also relatively good because we also looked at whether there were major difference between transplant and dialysis patients. That was not the case. And we also looked at younger and older patients, whether there was a kind of interaction and it was not the case. When comparing dialysis and transplant patients, we have to keep in mind what kind of patients it are. And when you look at age distribution, you can clearly see that dialysis patients in red versus transplant patients in blue, that dialysis patients are in general older. And of course, we are uh, transplanting, of course, the more younger dialysis patients that are in good health. So also when looking at the distribution according to frailty, and that's something specific that we collect in Iracoda, clinical frailty score, and a score of one is extremely fit, and a score of nine is the maximum, and that can be compared to almost terminally ill, you see that also the dialysis patients are more frail than transplant patients, and we have to adjust for that. So when we are going to compare mortality in kidney transplant patients in hemodialysis patients, in a crude analysis, kidney transplant patients have lower mortality, but when you adjust for age and sex, you see that the risk becomes more similar, but even slightly increased. And when you then also adjust for frailty and classical risk factors for COVID-19 related mortality, like obesity, hypertension, diabetes, etc., it becomes apparent that kidney transplant patients have a higher risk to die of COVID-19 than hemodialysis patients. People may object and say, yeah, that is because hemodialysis patients are often found because of asymptomatic screening in the dialysis unit. And that's one of the advantages of ERACODA. We know why people were screened. And when we look at the subset of subjects screened because of symptoms, and in kidney transplant, 496 kidney transplant overall, and 424 were screened because of symptoms. In hemodialysis patients, it was different. 1174 going down to 721, suggesting that more than 400 were found because of asymptomatic screening. But even when you look at this subset, it becomes apparent that kidney transplant patients have the same hazard rate, although not just uh, reaching statistically significant, but kidney transplant patients are having a higher risk. When comparing kidney transplant patients with hemodialysis patients, it's perhaps even more fair to compare waitlisted patients versus transplant patients the first year after the transplantation, because that's the clinical question. Do we transplant these waitlisted patients? Yes or no? Numbers become considerably smaller, but what you can see is that it seems that those kidney transplant patients in the first year after the transplantation versus waitlisted patients have a much higher risk to uh, die of COVID-19. And probably this is because of induction therapy. And there are more studies suggesting this. And when we see these numbers, it might suggest that we should stop transplanting in times of a COVID pandemic. But I don't think that is the case. 
this is a busy slide. I only will use the conclusion section. And that is that when you have COVID-19, the chance of dying from it is higher for a transplant versus a patient on dialysis. However, the chance of getting infected is much higher for dialysis patients. Dialysis patients have to travel to a dialysis unit, of course, three times a week. They cannot shield effectively, so they have a higher chance to become infected. But when infected, they do better than a transplant patient. But looking at overall mortality in the transplant population versus the dialysis population, the mortality overall is comparable because it is the chance to become infected times the chance to die of the infection. And I think that these data in combination suggest that perhaps it, it's not necessary to stop transplant programs in times of a high COVID-19 incidence. I spent some time about discussing risk in transplant and dialysis patients, but that question is then, is a milder forms of chronic kidney disease also associated with risk? And this is a beautiful study published in the American Journal of Kidney Disease 2020. It's a retrospective cohort study performed in 68 intensive care units in the United States, looking at more than 4,000 COVID-19 patients, 520 of them having CKD, defined as a GFR less than 60, and 143 were in dialysis. And what you can see, there's a kind of graded response that compared to the more general population, patients on dialysis have a higher risk to die, and patients with CKD not on dialysis have a risk that is in between. And the second lesson from this study is when you look at the causes of death, that, that there are different between the CKD population and the non-CKD population, because of course COVID-19 is a respiratory disease, but when you look at respiratory failure as cause of death, there was a significant trend, although in none of the groups it is significant, but the trend was significant, that respiratory failure is less important as a cause of death. And there are especially the cardiovascular causes of death that are more important, shock and also arrhythmias. We know that thromboembolic events are important, but in our population, less of a cause of death. We give anticoagulation, but then we see more major bleeds in our population. So mortality is higher, but also the causes of death are different. CKD, so conclusion, is associated with risk. How does it then compare with the other classical risk factors for COVID-19 mortality. And that was uh, shown in the Open Safely study that included 40% of all NHS patients in the United Kingdom, 70 million people, almost 11,000 COVID-19 related deaths, looking at the various risk factors in a fully adjusted model. And these are the classical cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension, but also obesity, diabetes, but also lung disease like asthma, other respiratory diseases, and here on top, CKD, GFR between 30 and 60, GFR less than 30, dialysis, and a solid organ transplant. And what you can see in the fully adjusted model is that especially the patients with a solid organ transplant, patients on dialysis, and with a severely impaired kidney function are at risk for mortality. And these are the patients that should be prioritized for vaccination in my opinion. And our field with solid organ transplant, hemodialysis, and severely impaired kidney function, that's more important than the classical risk factors for COVID-19 related mortality that we are always talking about. Which risk factors are important? In a subject, this, uh, these are data for the general population. Um, this is the open safety study again, age being hugely important, but also male sex, body mass index, diabetes, um, chronic heart disease, and COPD. This is the general population. When I now go down to dialysis patients in Iracoda, you see a completely different picture. So this general population, and this is the dialysis population. And what you see in the dialysis population that age is less important. 
that male sex is less important, that diabetes is not important, coronary artery disease is not important, and chronic lung disease is not important. And when we as clinicians are triaging patients who to admit to an intensive care unit, we make a kind of calculation in our heads. It is a dialysis patient. He is older. It is a male. He has coronary artery disease, diabetes, and is obese. And then we add up all these risk factors. But that is not fair because the only thing that is fair is that it is a dialysis patient and slightly about age that is a risk factor. But all these other things do not um, uh, count. And that might be the reason why I think that there is an under-treatment of our dialysis patient and that they have not got a fair chance to be admitted to uh, intensive care units. Last topic that I would like to cover with you is vaccinations, because we know that in later stage CKD, but uh, also in hemodialysis patients and kidney transplant recipients, there is less efficacy of vaccination due to uremia and to the use of immunosuppressive agents. And it holds for hepatitis B, influenza, but also for pneumococci. And to improve the immunization rate and efficacy, we have um, done uh, investigated various strategies. We change the injection mode, we add repeat vaccination and use adjuvants or immunostimulants to improve the immunogenicity of the existing vaccines. But what about COVID-19 vaccines? And when you look at the various studies that have been uh, performed with the various types of vaccines of the various producers, what you can see is that patients with CKD stages 4, 5 dialysis and the transplant recipients were excluded of nearly all the studies. Only the Pfizer study included subjects with CKD 4, 5 or dialysis, but the numbers were so small that we are not allowed to draw any conclusions there about the efficacy. Um, and that was reason that we sat together with a group of experts and that we said uh, that uh, chronic kidney disease is a key risk factor for severe COVID-19. And that there was a call to action by the European Renal Association to do more of um, clinical care, to change clinical care, but do also more research. And one of the points of uh, our call to action was that there should be more vaccination research. And that was the reason that we now started in the Netherlands, the RECOVAC consortium that is supported uh, by the Dutch government by 4.3 million euro. And we performing two studies. One is a small scale in-depth immunological study looking at the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines on immune response. And we are not going to measure on the antibodies. So zero response, but we are also looking at T and B cell responses. And in study two, that will be a large scale epidemiological study. We want to look whether what the efficacy is of the various COVID-19 vaccines to actually prevent COVID-19 in a real life setting. And we will assess antibody response in 12,000 patients, either kidney transplant recipients, patients on dialysis or with late stage CKD. But um, we don't have the results of our consortium yet, but the first data are at the moment uh, uh, coming out. And this is a study published as a research letter one week ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a placebo controlled, uh, oh, sorry, this is an older study. Sorry, this was in November uh, last year, looking at uh, uh, the Moderna compound, looking uh, this was a, a, a controlled dose escalation phase one trial, looking at healthy adults aged 18 to 55 or 55 to 85 years of age, and looking at the anti-spike IgG response. And what they did was look at day one after the first vaccination, day 21, day 28, and day 35, and what they looked at 10 microgram, 20 microgram, 30 microgram vaccine. And what they noticed that at day 21, so three weeks after the first vaccination, there was already a 100% zero response. That uh, younger subjects, but also 
all the subjects were responding. It was similar in the 2030 microgram um, vaccine, slightly better. What we are now using in clinical practice is the 100 microgram vaccine of Moderna. And these are the first data in kidney patients. And this, <laughs> sorry um, to be confused, but this is the publication that was published one week ago, and it shows you the first data in kidney patients. 436 uh, solid organ transplant recipients, 50% of them having received a kidney vaccinated with one single dose of Moderna, the 100 micrograms. They were vaccinated between December 16 and February 5, looking again at the anti-spike protein IgG response. And what they saw is that there was a detectable response in 76, but it was undetectable in 316. So zero response was 100% in healthy controls, but only 17% in this study in kidney transplant recipients. And when they looked at various factors that had a significant association, it was time since transplantation. It was also the type of immunoresponse uh, um, uh, immunosuppressant that people received and the type of vaccine. The Moderna vaccine being better than the Pfizer vaccine. And this study suggested especially a role for mycophenolate as um, an important factor that determines the efficacy of the zero response. Previous study was from the United States. This is a French study. Now in specifically kidney transplant recipients, 242, again, only one dose, so not a repeat vaccination, again, Moderna, again, looking at the anti-spike uh, protein, looking at zero, zero response, absent in 89%, present in 11%. So the previous study, 17%, here 11%, compared to 100% response in healthy controls. And they also looked at uh, factors associated with outcome. Again, time after transplantation, and I think that has a lot to do with the induction treatment that was given, um, anti-thymosate globulin, anti-CD25. Um, and here again, a role for mycophenolate as an important determinant of zero response. And I think this is our important findings. Uh, another study that came out just a couple of days ago looked at the zero response in kidney transplant recipients versus kidney waitlisted patients, smaller numbers, but now two doses, not a one dose, but two doses, but two uh, different uh, uh, vaccines used, Moderna or Pfizer. Again, assessing day 28, zero response. And what they noticed that in the kidney transplant recipients, zero response was even lower than in the two previous studies that I showed you. But looking at the kidney waitlisted patients, small number, but a far better immune response. So probably this has all to do with the use of immunosuppressants. And perhaps the lesson here is that we better first vaccinate before we transplant, that uh, perhaps we have to delay um, transportation in the people uh, uh, that are on the waiting list at this moment. I am not sure whether this is the case because this is also a beautiful study, it was published in Nature. It was a series of experiments in monkeys, in rhesus macacus, and some of these monkeys were infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Some were not infected, but then they received convalescent plasma. And in a beautiful series of experiments, it was suggested that relatively low antibody titers are already sufficient for protection against SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we see lower titers. It might be that this suggests that there is not a good protection. It might also indicate that there is still sufficient uh, protection. But anyway, even when 
antibodies would not be protected, then we still have the cellular immune response that contributes to protection, especially if antibody responses are suboptimal. That was clearly shown in this monkey model. And higher antibody titers are required for treatment of SARS-CoV-2 infection than for a vaccination. So will these rather disappointing results now also translate in a higher chance to become infected with COVID-19 is, in my opinion, not clear yet. This brings me uh, to my conclusions. COVID-19 related mortality rate in dialysis and transplant patients is exceptionally high and even milder forms of CKD are associated with increased risk to die from COVID-19. And this high mortality is not that much a problem of the elderly, but also perhaps even especially of younger patients. And in dialysis and transplant patients, risk factors for mortality are different than in the general population. So age and other clinical risk factors are less important and they sh this should have consequences for triage strategies. Long-term outcome after an episode of COVID-19 seems good, even in the elderly. So these findings together perhaps should suggest not to be too reluctant to admit patients with kidney failure to an intensive care unit. Another important uh, uh, conclusion is, I think there is no need to stop transportation programs in times of a high COVID-19 incidence. Patients with kidney transplant do have a higher uh, COVID-19 related mortality than comparable dialysis patients, but their risk to get infected is much lower. Absolute mortality is therefore not much different in transplants versus dialysis patients. And lastly, the first vaccination data are not comforting. A low response due to immunosuppression, especially in kidney transplant recipients, and perhaps there's a role, especially for MMF, and perhaps it's better to vaccinate first than to transplant. And uh, this is my last slide. I would acknowledge all the people working for ERACODA that are all our more than 200 collaborators, but also the other people of the working group and Kitty and Luc are uh, present at the moment, but also the management team, the advisory board and our sponsors. For joining the collaboration, for suggestions or questions, please contact us at this uh, email address. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ron. That was a fantastic run through. Um, so clearly a lot of work and you've put it all together in a, in a short period of, of time. So we've had quite a lot of um, questions and comments on the chat. Um, so I'll try and work my way through all of them. But first of all, can I just ask you, the 28 day mortality, is that only patients who are classified as dying of COVID or did you include people who were dying with COVID? Um, that's overall mortality. And then we asked also the reason for uh, mortality. And in nearly all cases, uh, uh, the investigators answered that it was COVID-19 related. Okay. So perhaps not directly the cause of death, but then indirectly hugely contributing and otherwise people would not have died. Okay. Um, do you have any comment on the test positivity rate? Now you might not know that information, but... Um... I don't know if you know it even for, for sort of local centres. Uh, whether there were centre differences, you mean? Yeah, so asking what the so Dr. Nuristan is asking what the test positivity rate is. So it'll be different, obviously, between different countries and different centres, but do you have any feel for that? Um, at the moment, our epidemiologist is looking at uh, centre differences and country differences, and also looking at regions in uh, Europe, but uh, I don't have a clear answer there yet at the moment. No, that's okay. Um, okay, so can I can I bring uh, Prof Hillbrands in, into the discussion? Um, so Dr. Nurisani is also asking about data on home dialysis, and I noticed, Luke, that you had commented that there weren't very many home dialysis patients included in ERA CODA. I don't know if you have any more information about them that you could share with us. No, thanks, uh, Kate. Uh, indeed, uh, there was only a very small proportion, proportion of patients with home dialysis. Also a small proportion of uh, patients on peritoneal dialysis. And currently we are working on a paper to compare the results in um, uh, peritoneal dialysis patients and hemodialysis uh, patients. But there, there's a, of course also a difference in patient characteristics, which makes us rather difficult to compare it directly. We have to, to do adjusted 
analysis and then you're never sure that you adjust for all the factors that are important yeah okay and to, to Dr. Um, Kate, El can I oh, sorry oh, Katie and I sorry this is Dia I just wanted to comment on the at least from yeah, the you know I know the U.S. side um, and the U.S. RDS data from at least this last year uh, it looks like you know from peritoneal dialysis patients they had chemo patients had three to four times higher hospitalization rate um, don't really expand on all of that but just from our data um, that's what we were seeing now we don't have a large you know PD population in general but uh, but some of that I think probably stems from you know in center the challenges we faced with cohorting patients and all of that and you know potential spread within in centers which I think is the same uh, is probably what you may see when you get some of your data yeah, um, so, um, I, I know she put your hand up, Prof Fowler, and I'll come to you in a second, but uh, Samira, Dr. Bell, can I ask you, from the Scottish data, do you have any feel for peritoneal dialysis um, and home hemodialysis in terms of hospitalisation? We, we, co we combined our um, home hemo and peritoneal dialysis and our um, positive was uh, prevalence was 5.7%. So 5.7% had a positive test overall combining both first and second waves, but we don't have data on hospitalisation because it's just linked data between the registry and the the testing. Thank you, and I'm um, Prof Ortiz. I don't know if you have any comment about the Spanish data. Uh, not not about the Spanish data, but I, I have questions. Um, okay, so can I can I come back to you for one second? Just because I, I noticed that okay. Prof Kevin Fowler has had his hand up for a while. So uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question, Prof Fowler? And then I'll, I'll yes. come back to you, Alberto. Thank, thank you. So I was to say, first of all, Ron, thanks for the presentation. Um, appreciate the, the thought put into it. The, the questions I have um, are thinking about the people that have CKD and then do have COVID. How does it if, impact their progression to kidney disease? And then by the same extension to kidney transplant recipients, um, if they are impacted. And um, I'm just curious if you could comment or Dia could comment upon, is that being studied in the US or in Europe? So thank you again. Luke, would you like to answer that? Well, uh, thanks. In, uh, in Iracoda, we have not, not included patients with CKD, so we have no outcome yet. Uh, we, can, we have no outcome data on, on that spe specific group. But we have included uh, transplant patients and we have um, uh, a three months uh, follow up um, uh, of a large cohort now. And we are analyzing that and we'll also uh, include the, in the number of uh, patients who had graft failure or uh, deterioration of uh, graft function. Um, and I'm not um, um, quite aware of the results that we have now in our cohort, but there is some literature uh, about this. And um, I think there is there is progression of uh, um, chronic allograft nephropathy in patients who had COVID-19 and even graft losses have been reported. Um, so I think the data will come out in the near future on that topic. Yeah, if I could just put a plug in and I'm happy to help anyone, but think about the US and I know outside, but there's 200,000 people in the US that are very interested like myself to hold on to that kidney transplant. and. I guess that just seems to not been part of the conversation that much in the U.S. But anyway, what it's worth. Yeah, that's an important uh, issue. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. No, I just think, uh, uh, Kevin, I think from the U.S. side, I know so much of our data is linked to dialysis patients. I know there's some transplant data. I think different centers are collecting data, um, but I don't have all those answers for you. But I agree it's a very important important question that we need to ask and and not only from you know the big picture but uh individually when we're talking to patients in clinic and i you know i'm not a transplant nephrologist but i follow patients uh you know years out from their transplant and we need to be able to answer those questions individually to them yeah and and i've just said it too i'm happy to help too so i'm not happy to help as well but it's just it's something that really has me concerned i think others too so yeah, so, so absolutely. So, so just before I go back to, to Alberto, um, I can't see everybody on my screen. So if you have a question and I don't come to you, please put it in the chat and I'll try and get to it. Um, but Alberto, if I could go to you, you had some questions you wanted to ask. Yes, yes. Uh, because both in Open Safely and in the Iracoda data, hypertension was associated with a decreased risk of death. So the question is, do we know why? Maybe it has to do with any of the therapies for hypertension, rash blockade, I don't know. Is there any information on that? Yeah, it has indeed been suggested 
that uh, treatment with ACE inhibitors or angiotensin II receptor blockers would lead to an overexpression of ACE2 that would not be protected, but even lead to deterioration to a higher chance of coming infected or dying. We also looked at this uh, in our ERACODA database. This is a publication just accepted uh, for publication in CJSON, um, but we saw, did not see any evidence there for RAS inhibitors, angiotensin II receptor blockers, or whatever type of uh, antihypertensive to be associated with this risk. And when we're looking at the decreased risk in, in hypertension versus non-hypertensives, I think we should acknowledge that these are fully adjusted models. And we adjust for the presence of a cardiovascular disease history. And I think and when they did in open safety uh, similar analyses, but then left out the adjustment for cardiovascular disease history, then suddenly hypertension becomes a risk factor. So it becomes in a, in a fully adjusted model. It seems even protective, although not significant. When you leave out the damage that hypertension is doing, then you see that actually hypertension is uh, associated with increased risk. So that is a remarkable finding, but we should not pay too much attention to it. It's just a epidemiological statistical uh, chance finding, I think. So yeah, Ron, chance on, finding is not a good word. So Ron, on that subject, um, so Prof Maria Salier is asking, do you think that because the cardiovascular risk is not increasing mortality from COVID-19 in dialysis, do you think that we're using the wrong assessment for cardiovascular risk? So we should be using different scoring systems for cardiovascular risk in these patients? Uh, different scoring systems uh, for dying, um, because there are still, there are some scoring systems whom to uh, admit to an intensive care unit, yes or no, and then you get points and all these points add up. But uh, the, what we are trying to show is th that there should be a different model in dialysis and transplant patients when making the decision whether or not to admit to an intensive care unit. Yes, um, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, by the way, Maria uh, of uh, Soler was, of course, uh, the first author of our CJSON publication on the RAS inhibitors. I did know she was uh, listening, uh, but uh, I would like to pay some tribute to her for uh, writing this beautiful uh, publication. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so, Prof. Yegar, you have your hand up. Oh, is that Kitty? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kate. Well, I, I have a question to Ron. Um, when I look at Twitter, I see a lot of patients that are so so very glad that they have received uh, they have received their vaccination, and they expect to uh, be able to go on living as they did before. And now, on the other hand, I see uh, these very disappointing results of vaccination in KRT patients, and then I wondered what. What would you, as a nephrologist, tell your patient uh, to do or not to do after they have received their vaccine? Uh, that's an excellent question because we see it happening all the time. People have re received their vaccination and um, be becoming less, uh, showing less safe behavior. But I don't think that's the, the good way to go forward. As physicians, we should advise our patients to shield even after a vaccination as good as they did before their vaccination until we get more comforting data that um, although the serial response might be lower, there still is a good uh, protective effect. But um, the first data on serial response are yeah, distressing. Um, and uh, patients should be aware of that, physicians should be aware of that. And it will take us a couple of months before we first get the clinical data about the chance of a kind of breakthrough COVID-19 infection, breakthrough a vaccination. And that, will, that knowledge will really guide us what our advice to our patients should be. But until these data become available, people should take care. 
Thank but you. I agree with you, Rowan. I think that you're right. People should continue to shield. Do you, would you like to pass comment anybody on the panel about um, maybe the role of, of T cell immunity? So maybe that the antibodies are less important and actually the T cells are, are more important? Luke? Uh, well, actually, I, I don't think we know yet what is the, 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 the clinical um, surrogate for pro productivity of the vaccination. So if that is indeed the antibody um, uh, diet or, or, or T cell response, um, I think it, uh, it, it will be important to, to do more research. And in fact, um, one of the studies that uh, Ron presented uh, aims to get more insight um, in, uh, in that issue, especially in kidney patients. So we are now vaccinating um, about uh, 800 um, um, individuals, uh, kidney patients and the, and the control group. And we are in depth uh, analyzing the antibody response and the T and B cell response in these patients and, um, and try to find which is the best uh, clinical correlate of protection, of course. Yeah. May I add to this? Um, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, mm -hmm. because uh, that was also a question in the chat. That's uh, people that received rituximab and when having received anti B cell therapy, no B cells, no chance of making antibodies and uh, no chance to make a sufficient uh, immune response. We know of several of these patients who had COVID-19, some of them not even severely ill. And uh, the majority of these patients survive COVID-19 and they have no serial response whatsoever. And that's comforting news, of course. So it's not only the serial response that is important. Apparently other types of immune response are important, especially T cell response. That was also shown in that monkey model in nature, where they looked at, uh, at the monkeys with a low antibody response, that there the cellular response became more um, important. And together it was still sufficient to protect these monkeys of an infection. So although the first data about the serial response are distressing, that does not necessarily imply that there is no uh, good protection. But we have first to await how it will translate in clinical practice. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we've had a comment in the chat, actually. Um, now, unfortunately, I don't know the name of the person, but somebody has mentioned that soon they will be publishing good titer levels in kidney transplant recipients after the second mRNA vaccine dose. So if that person would perhaps like to comment on that, then they could maybe just mention that to me in the chat and I'll, I'll bring them into the conversation. Um, now, I wanted to, to change direction slightly. So, I mean, you showed very nicely that the dialysis population should be given a chance in intensive care, but I think that in the vast majority of centres, often being on dialysis is a very negative um, point for getting into intensive care. So certainly in, in Scotland, um, we found it very difficult to get our dialysis patients into intensive care at the best of times, and particularly during COVID-19. So I, I think it'd be helpful actually if perhaps um, Ron, Luke, you could comment on the experience in the Netherlands, and then we'll ask um, Alberto and um, Samina for, for their experience. And any suggestions and tips to get them into intensive care would be good. Yeah, yeah I, yes. In, in in general, I think it's not a policy in the Netherlands to uh, to deny um, um, dialysis patients admittance to the intensive care unit. So that was not completely different now with COVID nineteen. Of course, we were very critical and 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 reluctant to to admit patients with severe COVID nineteen to um, uh, the intensive care unit. Uh, but but. In general, uh, also um, uh, dialysis patients had the opportunity to go to the intensive care unit uh, in, our, in our country, at least. Yeah, they do have the chance to go to an intensive care. The problem is that it was not offered because when we looked at the Dutch data and um, to all the dialysis patients of whom many died, mortality in dialysis patients in the Netherlands during the first wave was 33%, so huge, and only three dialysis patients were admitted to the intensive care on a national basis. And um, of course, there are no strict criteria uh, to say that they are not allowed to be admitted, but apparently there's a huge barrier um, because especially intensive care unit physicians think that prognosis is very bad, um, not only to survive, 
but also long-term outcome after a COVID-19 related uh, episode. Um, and that was also one of the reasons to establish Iracoda, because I have doubts whether we are doing something right there. But I don't know what the experience is in Southern European countries like Spain, Alberto. Well, it, 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 I think there is a huge impact of, of the size of the wave. So during the first COVID-19 wave in Madrid in March, healthcare services were overwhelmed. There were not enough rooms in hospitals. Hospice patients were sent back directly to the hospice, not, not, no admission whatsoever. And uh, access to ICU was uh, very difficult for anyone who had a pre-existent, any pre-existent health condition. Yeah, okay. And um, Samira, can you comment for Scotland? So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think um, following the first wave, it was even more difficult to get people into intensive care unit, particularly dialysis patients, because I think they felt that the outcomes were so poor. So certainly in our practice, um, patients would, would get the chance to go to high dependency, get non-invasive ventilation, but very rarely would, would a dialysis patient be escalated beyond that limit. Um, and I wonder if your findings are more of a selection bias and then the best patients got into intensive care and therefore the mortality was better? Yeah, I think that, that's, a, that's a very valid point. Ron, what do you think? Do you think there's selection Sorry. bias? Collection bias. Selection. Do you think there's selection bias? So you think, do you think that your patients who got into intensive care and did well were the ones who were most likely to do well anyway and were fit? To... Uh, sure. Um... These are only um, uh, observational data. <laughs> These are not data of a randomized clinical trial. Um, so we have always to be very, very cautious in when interpreting this data. And I think that's excellent that we now have a critical comment on that. But given the data that we have, um, I still make that point that there might be, might be under treatment. Um, but that's difficult to conclude from observational data. True. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, just a comment, I think, is this uh, in question? I think in the US, at least uh, regionally where I am, we had, even during the peak, we were fortunate to have uh, abundance of ICU beds or availability to transfer people, essentially. Um, I know it wasn't the case in every, every state um, per se, but um, we, and this is, you know, I don't have the data on this, but we did have, I, I primarily round on an ICU consult service. So six months out of the year, that's where I am. Um, and, you know, we see, we see a lot of ESRD patients that um, have done fairly well. And like I said, this is, this is my own personal observational data, not, not numbers. Um, having some of these ESRD patients that require ICU level care uh, compared to maybe the AKI patient who develops kidney failure during their COVID um, stay that don't, don't end up doing um, as well. But sometimes I think part of the reason for their ICU admission is not necessarily their COVID pneumonia. It's some other uh, complication of their ESRD that is more treatable. Um, but that's just, like I said, just the antidotal um, comment. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Pia. Um, so the, the comment I made earlier um, about the second dose of the vaccine leading to good antibody responses. So that came from Ido in Jerusalem. And um, what Ido is saying is that they saw low responses in kidney transplant and dialysis patients after the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine, but good eventual antibody responses after the second Pfizer dose. So I don't know where this paper is going to be published, but I guess we, we can look out for that and that might help us. Um, so then Dr. Nuristani has um, asked about BiPAP in COVID-19 patients and was wondering whether that was still a no. Dia has commented that uh, currently she is using BiPAP, so certainly we're using BiPAP non-invasive ventilation in in Scotland. Um, the the the, the question appears to have arisen because of concern about aerolizing the the virus, but obviously it's you know so it's an aerosol generating procedure and one must just take appropriate precautions. I presume in the rest of Europe, so in the Netherlands and Spain, you were using non-invasive ventilation where where appropriate with the appropriate protection. Yeah, so there's lots of lots of head head nodding. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so um, yeah, I, yeah. So I, th I think I think it's been widely widely used. I'm not quite sure why in um certain centres it was perhaps being uh, prohibited. 
Um, okay, so I want to just ask one final question before we round up uh, on time. So, um, Dr. Pace is asking about Sinovac vaccines, which are being used in um, his country, and wondering if there are any studies in the dialysis population for the use of the Sinovac vaccine. I'm not aware of any. I don't know whether Ron, Luke, Alberto, Samira. No. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we, we can't answer that that question. Um, Ron, do you have any final comments before we, we come to that conclusion? No, except uh, gratitude for being invited to present our data here, uh, Kate. Thanks. Uh, no, well, th thank you very much um, for, for agreeing. That, that's been really helpful, and I think it's really useful to see. I, I think it's nice to see how well people have pulled together to get this kind of data. So I think that's fantastic. Um, it's great that you were able to present it today, and thank you very much to Luke, Kitty, Alberto, and Samira for. for yes, I did. I did have a comment. Oh yeah, uh, sure, Alberto. Yeah, yeah. Last yeah, comment, yeah, last yeah, word. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, what's the information, or whether we should gather information on the impact of variants in the CK, in CKD patients and on the severity of disease in CKD patients? Uh, variants for the virus. Oh yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, so yes, you're going to gather, gather the data, Ron, or yes, you should? Um, we are going to gather the data. Um, we're trying to catch it. Um, it will be questions added to error code, and we'll, in our Dutch consortium, we will also have a look at it. But I'm afraid um, that the numbers will be quite low, especially when we start vaccinating. Um, the number of patients with a breakthrough COVID-19 will become low, then we have to look at genotype and perhaps there should be a kind of international uh, coordination there um, to get sufficient numbers. Um, we all assume that some of these newer genotypes will not respond well to uh, vaccination and it might also be different across different patient groups and that transplant patients and dialysis patients are especially a, a risk group uh, for breakthrough COVID-19 with the newer mutations. Um, but that will be a difficult topic to research and uh, let's unite there and uh, try to combine our data. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, thank you very much to you all. Um, the presentation will be available on YouTube in the near future. So if any of your colleagues or friends missed it, they'll be able to watch it there um, and on the Globecon website. Okay, enjoy your Sunday. Nice weather in Glasgow. I hope it's nice weather elsewhere. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. See you next week. Bye.